is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taryn Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Points. And we have quite a bit to talk about today as we had upsets galore, starting with Ole Miss. Ole Miss, ladies and gentlemen, upsetting Western Kentucky. They are the true team of the South as they managed to topple Western Kentucky in four sets. How did they do it? And how about the Utah Utes defeating number three Nebraska at Nebraska? Absolute madness. And not one but two wins for Baylor as they toppled Florida on the road, which was a big, 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 big win. Also, what about Louisville just stomping all over Purdue? ACC is better than the than the Big Ten? Hmm, possibly. And then we have all sorts of previews coming up, including a matchup that I plan to attend this Saturday, which hopefully I'll be able to as long as I get the green light. So set up the net. Hand me a volleyball, because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball talk. This is Tim Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on iSports Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. Thank you all for tuning in on this beautiful Monday afternoon. I appreciate it. I know I'm on a little bit earlier than normal, but that's kind of because I've got errands to run and whatnot. And it's, I apologize if I have to push this on to like 4 p.m. And also got to give a shout out to Gina G., for doing her thing with her show, Reppin' to NorCal Sports. I appreciate it. And she is passing the baton off to me as also going on on StreamYard is 3 and out with Larry B as he's going to have his primetime face-off. So I'll, I'm basically going on the same time as Larry is. So there's that right there in terms of that and... All in all, it's all it's all good in the hood because we're all just doing our thing and no one's interfering with anyone else. So I'm totally down with that. So without any further delay, let's get on into the volleyball action. But first, we have a word from our sponsors as iSports, the official sponsor of iSports Radio is none other than the SoCal Warriors. So unfortunately for the SoCal Warriors, they took a tough 38-8 loss to the Empire Inland Empire Kings at home, which put their record at 2-2 two two following week number 5. They will be back in action this week on the road against the Riverside Disciples, which should be a fun little matchup. I was actually at the SoCal Warriors football matchup last weekend, this past weekend, but that's for another day. I'm going to be talking about that when I do SoCal Supreme Sports Show, which this show isn't the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, so there's that. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players actually have to pay in order to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to stay in shape, playing to get filmed to trial for professional teams, big-time colleges, or any of those two. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017, because everyone in the world deserves a second chance. Whether whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you have been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCal Warriors and on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors. And they're also on Facebook by typing in the word Southern California Warriors in the search bar. The second sponsor for iSports Radio is Background Check International Businesses. Are you looking to background check a new hire on? Let Kit Freeman take care of that for you. Kit founded and has managed Background Check International since 1994. 
at the time, I was probably one year old, by the way. Fun fact. And he's here to help you with the screening process. Contact Kit and let him help you make the hiring process that much easier. This business is used for professional background checks and not for any of the use of crimes such as identity theft and illegal activity. You can follow them on Facebook by typing in the words Background Check International BCI. You can also go to their website, www.bcint.com. So thank you to those two sponsors for being the official sponsor of iSports Radio, your direct feed for all of that sports. You can follow iSports Radio on Twitter and on Instagram at iSports Radio. And if you go to Facebook, just type in the word IE, then the word sports, and then radio. And you can also check out iSports Radio's website website at www.iesportsradio.com so without any further delay let's get on into this volleyball show so we had quite a number of matchups that happened and there are a lot of upsets so let's go over the the entire slate from last week so last tuesday we had texas number 1 texas sweeping texas state which that comes to no that comes to me as no surprise. Texas is just everything it is and more. They return all it but one of their players from last year's team that made the championship game. So there's that. Then on Wednesday, number three Nebraska took down number nineteen Creighton in straight sets on the road. And I say on the road a little loosely because this was played in Omaha and this was basically a crosstown rivalry and Nebraska pretty much just took down Creighton. There was a lot of people in attendance, but I think most of those fans in the stands were wearing red. And that's kind of interesting right there. And just because, you know, obviously it's tough. And for one, I think that there should have been more Creighton fans, honestly. And it would have been it would have been great if they had... Uh, if they had more fans in the stands, but unfortunately they did not. And as a result, they were unable to, they had more fans than Nebraska had more fans than whatchamacallit, than Creighton, which was, which is sad to have, but it's a, it's a crosstown rivalry. It's kind of like the Rams and whatnot. So Rams and Chargers and whatnot. So it is what it is, but what can you do? <laughs> so, yeah, Creighton got swept by Nebraska. Then on Thursday, we had San Diego upsetting UCLA th- five, three sets to two. So that was qu- that was also quite the uh, surprising little matchup right there. I was very surprised that happened. So good for the Toreros as they got their first breakout victory. Then on Friday, we had Wisconsin defeating Kentucky in four sets, Washington defeating Pepperdine in four sets, Baylor defeating Florida in four sets via an upset. And you also had Minnesota defeating Stanford in four sets, Louisville sweeping Purdue in three sets. Keep in mind, Louisville was the number 10 team at the time, and Purdue was number 6. Well, then we also had Pitt, who was number four at the time, defeating number 12 BYU in four sets, Oregon sweeping Penn State, then Rice defeating LSU, and then Georgia Tech defeating Indiana in four sets. Another noteworthy matchup that happened via an upset was Santa Clara defeating South Carolina in four sets, which was the battle of the SCs other than Southern California. So that was quite amusing there. I'll be getting into the the upsets in a little bit. And on Saturday we had Kentucky sweeping Marquette. Then we had number 20 Utah or then number 20 Utah upsetting Nebraska on the road in five sets. Then we had Baylor sweeping Florida. Keep in mind Baylor was the number 17 team at the time and Florida was like number I want to say they were like number nine at the time. I've got this. Yeah, seven. Baylor was seventeen last week, and then Florida was number seven. So yes, that was another big win 
for Baylor. Then we had Minnesota outlasting Oregon in five sets. Keep in mind that Minnesota was the number 13 team at the time, while Oregon was number 11. Then we had Stanford, which was the number 14 team at the time, outlasting number 18 Penn State in five sets. And then we also had then number 25 San Diego getting its revenge on San Diego State by defeating them in four sets. And those were all the Saturday noteworthy matches. Then on Sunday, we had... We had Notre Dame losing to Texas in four sets, though it was a very competitive four-set match. So honestly... It was very close. I, I I honestly thought Notre Dame was uh, was going to force the fifth set, but unfortunately Texas said no because Texas is just too talented, and Notre Dame is still kind of trying to figure themselves out. So unfortunately, it 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 was what it was. But Notre Dame is starting to get better. So there is that right there, and then Wisconsin swept Marquette, which was. No big deal. So I was very surprised to see Marquette not doing well this weekend. I guess they kind of struggled against the – they're not quite there yet when it comes to taking down the stiff competition. But they're going to have to be pretty soon as if they wanted to win the big East Conference, then they're going to need to get challenged and – face some of these bet, bigger and better teams because Creighton knows that they're going if they somehow lose the Big East then they'll then they then possibly having a at large spot could come tough for them considering they are a non power five conference. They're a good non power five conference, but sometimes that non power five conference team could get left out, which is kinda sucky, but it it is what it is, so all right, now let's jump over to the upsets that happened. So we'll actually go from most significant upset, well, the least significant upset to the most significant upset, which this is, in my opinion, in terms of that category. So the first upset we have is South Carolina, which was number 24 at the time, losing to Santa Clara. Now, Santa Clara, I've always seen Santa Clara as a underrated team. They obviously have a good team, the problem is, is that they get overshadowed by Pepperdine, San Diego, and BYU. By the way, BYU is moving to the Big 12, so soon. But I digress on that. So back to Santa Clara. They have a lot of talent on that team. They have Michelle Schaefer, Julia San Giacomo, who is their headliner. And they have the up-and-coming Sophia Tolino, who had a great freshman year last year. So Santa Clara dropped the first set in close fashion, 26-24, to 24, which, if you all remember my interview with Mike Seeley, whenever you drop a heartbreaker close set like that, you have to be prepared to play four more hours of volleyball. So that's what Santa Clara did as they bounced back from that first set and took the second set 25-17. to 17. Then they took the third set in dominating fashion 25-16, to 16, as they never trailed and it was never tied. And then in set number four, it was back and forth between the Broncos and the Gamecocks, but the Broncos just galloped their way past the Gamecocks and won the fourth set 25-22, to 22, earning them the upset. And the stats are rather surprising. So Santa Clara was led by Julia San Giacomo, who had... 20 kills. She hit 298, which is quite nice. And she ha- only had six hitting errors. As a team, Santa Clara only had 15 hitting errors as a team, which is quite nice. Then Michelle Schaefer had 16 kills. She hit 306 and had only five hitting errors. While Sophia Tolino had 14 kills, only one hitting error, and she hit 382. So. Say hello to Gina G and Brad Buckingham. Thank you, too, for tuning in. And Gina, if you're still listening, Santa Clara, which is in NorCal, pulled off the big win over South Carolina. So great stuff for the Broncos. I really think the Broncos are kind of that sneaky good team. Last year, unfortunately, they had to postpone most of those games. They didn't get their season start until probably like two or two or three weeks into the season. So, and they had to postpone quite a bit of games. So, I feel for Santa Clara. I've seen Santa Clara play. They have good players. 
and they have the talent. It's just that they just need an opportunity to get that chance to get on the court. So, Niv Tulieta had 46 assists, while Santa Clara had a mind-blowing 12 service aces. They had four aces from Anna Stucci, four aces from San Giacomo, three aces from Tulino, and one ace from Schaefer. In terms of blocks, they Santa Clara had eight, four blocks, eight block assists, while Santa Clara also missed 12 serves. So they had an even serve ratio in terms of service aces and service errors. And then in terms of digs, Santa Clara had 54 digs as a team. 20 of them went to Cat Georgia Dis. I probably butchered that name, but I digress. So Cat Georgia Dis had 20 digs. Michelle Schaefer had 12 digs. Sophia Tolino had seven digs, and San Giacomo had six digs, along with Tulieta. As a team, Santa Clara hit 301, which was absolutely g- great to see. Other than that first set, they really hit above 250 or higher, and that is great stuff for Santa Clara. For South Carolina, their offensive output wasn't as big as Santa Clara's, as they were led by Riley Whitesides, who had 12 kills. She hit 250. Kyla Manning had 10 kills, while Lauren McCutcheon and Ellie Ruprich had 7 kills. So they didn't get, so they were a little bit more balanced, but they didn't have the big nights that they had. Like, Santa Clara was just a three headed monster, while South Carolina tried to be, like, more balanced. Where I think South Carolina had a difficult time slowing down Julia San Giacomo. And it's tough to, because. Julia is six foot five. Like every girl I've, I've met when it comes to interview is six five. That has the name Julia. It's kind of funny, <laughs> but I digress on that. Anyway, in terms of assists, South Carolina ran their six two offense to a T as Mallory Dixon and Claire Wilson had eighteen and sixteen assists. In terms of service aces and service errors, South Carolina had. Four aces, but they missed seven serves. They had two aces from McCutcheon, while one ace went to Manning and Whitesides. In terms of blocks, they had four blocks as a team, one solo block and th- three. Well, yeah, one solo block and six block assists, which total up to three blocks. And then in terms of digs, they had forty-nine digs as a team. Eleven of them went to Morgan Carter. Nine of them went to McCutcheon. Manning went, eight of them went to Manning, and then six of them went to Whitesides and Dixon. As a team, South Carolina hit 227, which wasn't bad, but they started getting worse and worse. Well, they got really worse in the third set. They started getting better in that in that fourth set, but it just wasn't enough. As South Carolina suffered its second loss of the season, their first loss came against Pitt, which was a very good team. So I'm kind of surprised to see South Carolina losing, as this match was actually played in Kennesaw. It was played at the Kennesaw State University Con- Convocation Center. So this was in a little bit of a this was in a tournament down south. So I thought South Carolina was better, but it is what it is. So the next match. That the next upset that I have to recap that I must recap is Ole Miss defeating number fifteen Western Kentucky. Now this was quite the upset. I didn't even know Ole Miss was undefeated, and I think Ole Miss has flown under the radar. And I think we need to keep an eye on Ole Miss and most of the other teams in the SEC because that SEC is looking really good. It's not just Ole Miss. It's not just Ole Miss that's good. It's it's Tennessee that's good. Arkansas is solid and you still have the other higher ups in Florida and Kentucky which are really good. LSU I still have confidence in. I think they can turn their season around. It's just that it's going to be a little bit tougher to do so. So I think the SEC is a little underrated in my opinion and I think people need to stop hyping up Kentucky and Florida and start buying more stock in some of these littler teams like Tennessee or Ole Miss. So as for Ole Miss's upset against Western Kentucky, Ole Miss took the close first set 25-23, to and they took the second set 25-20, to as they didn't trail in that second set. Then the third set, there were 12 ties and 7 lead changes, but Western Kentucky was able to salvage that one set by 
taking it 25-22. to 22. And then in set four, there were 11 ties, but only three lead changes as Olmus took the fourth set 25-17 to 17 and won the match over Western Kentucky, which was a big win for them as they were participating in the Bowling Green Tournament. So as for Ole Miss, they were led by Peyton... I'm going to butcher this girl's name. Peyton Broch, who had 16 kills. She hit 393, and she had five hitting errors. Sasha Ratliff had 15 kills, only one hitting error, and she had a blistering 609. That was a That's a very good output right there. And that just goes to show you that everyone needs to start paying more attention to Ole Miss. And I'm guilty of this, too, just because I know that Ole Miss was that good, but... I guess we need to start buying more stock in Ole Miss. And then Gigi Carvacho had 12 kills. She did have a poor 90 hitting percentage of 94, and she had 9 hitting errors. But luckily, she was able to get some great contributions from Ratliff and Broch. Um, there are, uh, Ole Miss also got contributions from Samantha... Schnitta, who had eight kills, and Anna Bear had seven kills. So it just goes to show you that Ole Miss has some good hitters on their team. As a team, Ole Miss hit 235, which wasn't bad. And Kylie McLaughlin had 48 assists, and she chipped in one kill. Ole Miss had uh, six service aces, and they only missed seven serves, which wasn't bad. As six different players had one service ace. In terms of blocks, Ole Miss really excelled in this category. They had they had 26 block assists and two solo blocks for a grand total of 15 blocks, which was quite nice. And then in terms of digs, they had 59 digs. 17 of them went to Sam Bergio. Or, yeah, Sam Bergio had 17 digs. McLaughlin had 11 digs. And then Gigi Carvacho had 8 digs. And... That is pretty much that for Ole Miss's output. Now, Western Kentucky had... I don't know if it was just an off night for them, but some of their stats are kind of mind-blowing, as the Hilltoppers were led by Paige Briggs, who had 12 kills, only three hitting errors for a hitting percentage of 265. She did take 34 swings, which is why her hitting percentage isn't as high as some of the Ole Miss players. And then also, Lord Matthews had 10 kills, four hitting errors, and she hit only 194. Avery Davis and Kaylin Jackson each had nine kills, but they hit below 200. Nadia Diudon had 40 assists, and she also chipped in one kill. Now, this was kind of one of the. This were now the next few stats are some of the stats that almost bettered Western Kentucky in. First off, Western Kentucky had only two service aces, and they missed nine serves, which. Compared to Ole Miss, they had six service aces and only missed seven, which, yikes. And then in terms of blocks, Western Kentucky had one block while, well, well they had one solo block and 16 block assists, which total up to nine blocks, as opposed to Ole Miss, which also, which had 15 blocks. So it was basically another blunder on Ole Miss's, well, on Western Kentucky's part. And then in terms of digs, Western Kentucky had 46 digs compared to Ole Miss's 59, which was not good. And then the cherry on top is hitting percentage. Western Kentucky hit only 168 as opposed to Ole Miss's 235. Now, the 235 isn't as big, but Western Kentucky only hitting 168 is kind of concerning for being the number 15 team in the nation. So, Western Kentucky still has a little ways to go in order to be amongst the elite as they just ran into a hotter Ole Miss team. So good for the Rebels. So that's nice right there. Now we're going to get into some of the little bit more significant upsets as not that those two weren't significant upsets. These were basically ranked on ranked upsets as we had San Diego toppling UCLA in five sets. San Diego won the first set, then UCLA won, won the second set, then San Diego won the third set, UCLA won the fourth set, and the fifth set was very tight. It looked like UCLA was going to come back and win the fifth set, but San Diego was able to take it from them. 
and they won it 15 to 12. San Diego was led by Emily Wilson and Kylie Priest, who each had 14 kills. Both of them only had one. Uh, yeah, both of them hit in the 100, so that wasn't really that good. Both of these teams did not hit the ball well, which could also be attested to the blocks, which I'll be getting into in a little bit, but we shall see. Grace Rowling also got 12 kills as well, and then Layla Blackwell had 7 kills. And then in terms of assists, Isadora Turkariel had 43 assists, and in terms of service aces and service errors, San Diego only missed four serv- serves, and then they had six service aces. Annie, Benbow, and Priest had two aces apiece. And then in terms of digs, San Diego had 64 digs. 24 of them went to Benbow, while Turkariel had 10 digs, and... Priest had nine digs, and Froling had eight digs. And then this was kind of one of the bigger statistics, which led to lower hitting percentages by both teams. San Diego had 17 blocks. Nine of them were solo stuffs, and 16 of them were block assists. So that's quite the significant stat. And as a team, San Diego only hit 146. Now UCLA, on the other hand, was led by Mac May, who had 30 kills. 30 kills. As a team, UCLA had 62 altogether. So... McMahon almost had half the kills that the team produced altogether. And then Charity Looper had 19 kills. But those are the only two big hitters. The next highest kill leader had three kills. And that was... Actually, no, four kills. And that was Shelby Martin, the setter. And speaking of setter, Shelby Martin had 44 assists, so there was that statistic. UCLA always serves tough, but they missed 13 serves and only had 5 aces. Three of them went to May, while Martin and Zoe Fleck each registered one service ace. In terms of digs, they had 66 digs. 20 of them went to Fleck. 12 of them went to Martin. Elon McCall had 11 digs. Looper had 10 digs. Mac May had 9 digs. And that was it. In terms of blocks, UCLA had 13 blocks as a team. Six of them were solo stuffs, while eight of them were block assists. And as a team, UCLA hit 163. So both these teams' hitting percentage was low due to the great number of blocks. For UCLA, I think their problem was is that they relied too much on Mac May and too much on Charity Looper. Now, if they didn't have Charity Looper, Mac May would just be swinging for the fences. She would be suffering from the Sonia the Yasiana Presley syndrome from what Baylor has to deal with. So And keep in mind Mac May had to take sixty five swings. That's quite a lot. And Looper had to take forty eight of them. So it can't just be the charity looper and Mac May show. Like UCLA needs to get more hitters involved. And Shelby Martin can only hit the ball so much considering she is a setter. And other than Martin, the next highest kill leader after Martin had three kills. And at least they got some players in, like Francesca Alupe and Elon McCall. But still, it's going to need to be a better team effort from UCLA. Coercely for San Diego, I, someone who I'm not surprised who I'm surprised that's not on this stat sheet is Katie Lukes their preseason All-West Coast Conference recipient. Now, I don't know what happened to her. I don't know if she got hurt. I don't know if she's in COVID protocols. I don't know what happened to KT Lukes. But the fact that San Diego was able to defeat UCLA without her speaks to high volumes of how good San Diego is and that they needed this win in order to make a statement just because they were getting disrespected as being the number 25 team in the nation, as opposed to being, what, in the in the low 20s? Like, 21-20? But San Diego really proved themselves, and I thought UCLA was going to defeat them, but I guess I was... I underestimated the Toreros, but it's good for the Toreros that they got a breakout win such as that. I think against a program like UCLA, that is a huge win. And the fact that they, and the fact that 
Mac May had a big night such as that, but UCLA was unable to pull out the victory, speaks to how valuable Charity Looper is and all the other hitters are. As Mac May hit 308, I also need to make note of that. But she also had 10 hitting errors, but still she had a phenomenal hitting night. I mean, it just would have been great if she got more help, but that's kind of what Mac May needs to do. But it's not a recipe for success. Let me just tell you that. And then we had not one but two upsets from Baylor. As the first match, Baylor defeated Florida in four sets. The Bears were led by Yastiana Presley, who had 17 kills, while Avery Skinner had 16 kills, and Lauren Harrison chipped in 12 kills, which was pretty good. In terms of assists, Hannah Sedwick had 47 assists, while service aces and service errors were in favor of Florida, as both teams had 11 service errors, while Baylor had 6 aces and, and Florida had 7 aces. In terms of blocks, Baylor actually got outdone in this category, but if you see the hitting percentage, it might not ultimately matter. Baylor outdug Florida 55-46, to while Baylor hit 220 as opposed to Florida's 183. Florida was led by Tara Caesar, who had 15 kills, while Thayer Hall had 13 kills, and Lauren Forte chipped in 8 kills. So, for for Baylor, I think this really showed that they are for real. And that's just the first match. The second match, Baylor actually swept Florida the day after. And keep in mind, this was in Gainesville. I didn't think Baylor was going to win both matches. I thought they were going to win at least one, considering they needed to after losing to Tennessee and Pitt in five sets. But Baylor really showed their stuff. They swept... Florida, 25, 19, 25, 18, and 25, 16. That was way more dominating than that four-set win over Florida. And that's making a statement right there. Lauren Harrison surprisingly led the way with 14 kills. She only had one hitting error, and she had 26 swings for a hitting percentage of 500. Yassiana Presley had 13 kills. She had a hitting percentage of 296, while Avery Skinner had 9 kills and a hitting percentage of 238. One thing I think which led to Baylor's success was that Avery Skinner knew what to expect from Florida because keep in mind, Avery Skinner transferred from Kentucky to Baylor, which was big stuff right there. And then Hannah Sedwick had 31 assists in terms of service aces versus service errors. Baylor had two aces and four service errors while Florida only had one ace and eight service errors, which was a big alarming stat right there. In terms of blocks, now Baylor really dominated this category in the second game as Baylor had 12 blocks compared to Florida's 5. And that's kind of concerning if you are Florida. Like, Florida has a pretty big team, if you ask me. It's not the tallest team like when they had Rachel Kramer, but it's kind of... I thought Florida was better than that. And then in terms of digs, they were neck and neck. Baylor had 37, while Florida had 36. As a team, Baylor hit 318, while Florida hit a dismal 111. Florida was led by Tara Caesar, who had 19 kills. She had a hitting percentage of 283, but she also had 6 hitting errors. Thayer Hall was the next best kill leader with 8 kills, but she hit only 71. The next kill leader after Thayer Hall only had 3 kills, and now those were 2 players right there. So, it was not an impressive outing for Florida, and I think they're way better than that, playing at home. Like, if they had lost to any other team, I think this might have been super alarming for them, but I think this isn't too alarming, as long as they don't, like, have those matches, like, pile up. Because SEC play is going to be very tough, and I think the SEC is up for grabs, because Kentucky's a bit down, Florida is still trying to find some answers because they lost some players to transferring. And then you have some of the other teams which are on the rise, like South Carolina, even though they lost to Santa Clara. You have Tennessee, which lost to Pitt in five, which is their only loss. You also have Ole Miss, which is undefeated. And then and then LSU. Again, I'm, I'm not giving up on LSU. They return most of those players, and I think that team has the potential. So... We shall see. As for the next upset we have, we're 
just down to two more upsets, then we'll shift into the top 25, then we'll go on break. This one was another shocking upset. This was number 10 at the time, Louisville, defeating number 6 at the time, Purdue. Purdue was number 6, which was its highest ranking in its program's history. But I think that kind of got a little into their head as Louisville took the first set 25-19 and the second set 25-16 and the third set 25-21. So I think Louisville thought that they were better than that and also I think Purdue kind of got a big head after receiving that number six poll ranking from the coaches poll. As Louisville was led by Anna DeBeer with 12 kills while Anna Stevenson had 11 kills, zero hitting errors, and a hitting percent of 661. Ico Jones had eight kills to chip in as well, as Tori Dilfer ran the offense with 34 assists. And in terms of service aces versus service errors, Louisville had five aces to produce one, while Louisville had seven service errors to produce six. In terms of blocks, Purdue had 12 blocks as a team, while Purdue only had seven. They didn't have any solo stuffs while Louisville had four. In terms of digs, Louisville had 56 digs and Purdue only had 48, even though they got 20 of them from Jenna Otek. And as a team, Louisville hit 257 as opposed to Purdue's 124. Purdue was led by Caitlin Newton, who had 11 kills, while Grace Cleveland added 9 kills. And then after that, their next highest kill leader had 4 kills, and that was Madeline Koch. So... Kind of a little concerning for Purdue. I thought they were better than that. But Louisville just dominated them in every aspect of the game for the most part. They even held Purdue to only a hitting percentage of 51. Which, for Purdue, they returned most of those players. No, they returned all the players from last year. So to see them losing in straight sets is kind of surprising this was played in Cincinnati, Ohio, so eh, I don't know what happened with Purdue, but that was that's kind of a nasty loss for them. So I know they're better than that. So And then lastly, this was the biggest upset to me in my opinion. This was number 20 at the time, Utah defeating Nebraska in Nebraska. I was very surprised about this and I couldn't believe it. I thought Utah wasn't didn't have that. Have, yeah, I didn't think Utah didn't have it in them. But some of you need to remember that Nebraska actually went five with Omaha, which that team is nowhere near on the level of that Utah is. But they're kind of underrated for their conference, so we'll see. So the first set, Nebraska actually took it 25-18. to 18, And then the second set, Nebraska narrowly took the second set 26-24. to 24. And at that point, everyone in Nebraska was thinking, oh, we've got this. We are going to win, right? No. In the third set, there were 14 ties and 16 lead changes as Utah took the third set 27-25. to 25. Then the fourth set, it was also tight, but there was only one lead change as Utah won that set. 25 to 22 and then in the fifth set there were five ties and three lead changes but in the end utah was able to grind out that fifth set and win it 15 to 13 pulling off the reverse sweep and pulling off the victory over nebraska which was huge for utah i think everyone was disrespecting utah in that conference but they said put some respect on her name which was very very good so breaking down this little matchup right here, Danny Drews, who is in no relation to Annie Drews, the U.S. Olympian, had 27 kills. She did have 15 hitting errors, and she took 68 swings, but she did get help from some of her other pin hitters, such as Zoe Weatherington, who had 17 kills, 7 hitting errors, and a hitting percentage of 286. And then she, and then Utah also got Madeline Robinson with 12 kills, 6 hitting errors for a hitting percentage of 188. And then in terms of assists, Steph Jenna Kuzic had 50 assists. I probably butchered her last name, but I digress. Both teams had 10 service aces and 8 service errors, which is quite funny. And then in terms of blocks, Nebraska had 8 blocks as a team, while Utah had 20. 
Now, the Digs, this one, this statistic went all the way to Utah as Utah had five different players in double digits in terms of Digs. They got 21 Digs from Vanessa Ramirez, 16 Digs from Drews, 14 Digs from Steph, and 12 Digs apiece from Robinson and Megan Yet. They had 78 digs as in total, which was quite astounding compared to Nebraska's 63 digs. And as a team, Utah only hit 191, which was kind of surprising. Their best hitting percentage, however, came in sets 3 and 5, where they hit over 300. In set 1, they hit negative 31, and they only hit 7 in set number 2. As opposed to Nebraska, they were led by... Lindsey Krause, who had 15 kills, while Kayla Caffey and Allie Battenhorst only had 10 kills apiece. Surprisingly, Lexi Sun only had 8 kills. She took 35 swings, and she had 8 hitting errors for a hitting percentage of 0. So, kind of surprising to see Lexi Sun not having that big of a night. But, maybe she got hurt. I actually don't know, but... For Nebraska, they're going to need other players to step up, and they kind of did, because it's not the Lexi Sun show. It's the Nebraska-can-do-it-all show. Nicklin Hames had 39 assists, while in terms of blocks, like I said, Nebraska had 8 blocks as a team. In terms of digs, they got 17 digs from Nicklin Hames, 15 kills from Lexi Rodriguez. I don't know why I did it like that, but I digress. Kale Lawn... Kale... I'm going to butcher her first name. Kiana Lay Akana had nine digs, and Sun had eight digs. As a team, Nebraska hit 202, which was kind of good. Their best hitting percentage came in set three, where they hit 342. But other than that, they hit 100 in sets one, two, and four, and then they hit 233 in set number five, which, to me, I was also surprised to see Nebraska getting reverse swept because Nebraska rarely gets reverse swept. Normally it's Nebraska reverse sweeping the other team. But for Nebraska to have such a eh outing like that, I thought they would have done better. It just goes to show that Nebraska, too, is not without its weaknesses. I think it's any given day that some of these teams can pull out the victory, like Utah against Nebraska, San Diego against UCLA, I can't take anyone for granted. Or, heck, even Ole Miss against Western Kentucky. So, that is that for all the recaps of the upsets from last week. We are going to get into the top 25. Then we'll take ourselves a quick little breaky break. And then we'll get on into the second part of this show. And then we shall send you all on your way. Because we've got Monday Night Football coming up. So, we have a new top 25 here. So... 21 through 25 includes Colorado at 25, who is just now, which is the newest team and the only new team to enter the top 25, which is kind of surprising. I have to, I may have to look up how good Colorado is. So Colorado is at 25. Pepperdine is at 24 after they just narrowly escaped a five set win over Cal Poly. Western Kentucky is at 23. Tennessee is at 22 and San Diego is at 21. 16 through 20 includes Penn State at 20, UCLA at 19, Georgia Tech at 18, Creighton at 17, and Stanford at 16. 11 through 15 includes BYU at 15, Florida at 14, Oregon at 13, Baylor at 12, and Minnesota at 11. 6 through 10 includes Utah at 10, Purdue at 9, Kentucky at 8, Washington at 7, and Nebraska at 6. And then 1 through 5 includes Louisville at 5, Pitt at 4, Ohio State at 3, Wisconsin at 2, and your number one team in the nation is... This is no surprise. Texas. So, those are your top 25 for this week. I'm kind of surprised to see Georgia Tech ranked above UCLA just because... Georgia Tech lost to UCLA. I think you could switch UCLA and Tech because it's not that it's not like UCLA got swept by San Diego. It obviously lost to San Diego, and it was a road game. So I think you can give UCLA the nod over Georgia Tech. And then Colorado, that team is kind of surprising. I'm surprised Colorado has. Uh, 
is in the top 25. Let, let's actually uh, look up their uh, roster and schedule real quick as to who they have beaten and who and what their record is as this is, they are 7 and 0 so 7 and 0 that's good they beat south carolina state xavier south carolina state in straight sets xavier in four sets charlotte in three sets and then they won the big 10 pac 12 challenge as they beat iowa in four sets and they beat illinois in five sets on the road so good stuff and then in their own little Buffs Invitational Tournament, they beat Texas Tech in four sets, they swept San Jose State, and they beat Northern Colorado in four sets. So this week for Colorado, they are they have a bat yeah, they have two games against their interstate rival, the uh, Colorado State. On Thursday they play at home, and then on Saturday they play at Colorado State. If I remember correctly, I think this is this rivalry is called the Rumble in the Rockies, or is that Utah, Colorado? I actually don't know, but uh, but honestly, I it, it's it's a good little rivalry. I think it's going to be a fun little rivalry. Rocky Mountain Showdown, that's the name. So I'm guessing Rumble in the Rockies is Colorado versus Utah. So I was partially right. I'm still trying to get the names of all these rivalries because this week is actually rivalry, rivalry week We in, in terms of NCAA women's volleyball. Last week we kind of got the tip of the iceberg as we had San Diego State and San Diego doing battle. But this week we've got a lot more rivalry games, which you're going to have to keep it locked on set point because we are going to head to a commercial break. When we come back, let's preview some noteworthy NCAA women's volleyball matches and let's pre let's go over some noteworthy high school matches just because there have been some state rankings and we'll see if how everyone is doing in terms of California and all over the nation. So you are listening to Set Point here on iSports Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. We'll be right back after this. Hey guys, it's Blake Henley, better known as H-Town Blake to some of you. Happy to announce that Face is Loaders back in full force. We'll be bringing that high heat every Tuesday night here on IE Sports Radio. So come home, get ready, dig into that batter's box, and see if you can chase that high heat, baby. So we'll be coming to you live with all the stats, all the rundowns, all the division rivalries, and every team that's going to make the playoff push to get to that one and only October and get to the pinnacle of what baseball is to hoist that commissioner's trophy when it's all said and done. It's your boy, Marcus Los Great. Here to give you what you want. Here to give you what you need. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live. Straight from your mama's basement with a crispy white tea. <laughs> We are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports.
Hey, sports fans. Do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh, yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all, and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And we are back with segment number two of Set Point. You can catch all of our amazing shows on several different streaming platforms such as Spreaker, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict. And this show, Set Point, is actually on iHeartRadio, which I didn't think this would show would ever make iHeartRadio, but I digress. Maybe it's because it's dedicated to a certain sport and not a certain little... And not a certain, I guess, show region. But, hey, what can we do? Also, i got to make note of something. I know it's not for a while, but in 17 more days, Set Point will be turning two years old, which is absolutely amazing. And I can't believe we're approaching the two-year anniversary of when I said, what is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taryn Rodriguez, for the first time when it came to me hitting the airwaves. So I'm hoping to have a very special show. Maybe I'll have some guests on like I did with the 100th episode. I'll have to see, but we are in segment number two of Set Point. So let's actually talk a little high school volleyball. So in my neck of the woods, I actually saw some nationally power, yeah, some nationally ranked teams go down, such as Redondo Union, which... Eventually, which actually lost to my alma mater, Newport Harbor. I'm not going to go too much in-depth on that, but I was very surprised to see Redondo Union losing. But I guess they're still also learning as well because they don't have the team that they did two seasons ago. That team is fairly, I wouldn't say young, but they have one of the best outside hitters in the class of 2023 as as Redondo Union is probably going to win their league, and I think they could still win their region, their southern section championship, and maybe make a push for the state championship. So no one is going to be sleeping on Redondo Union, but that was quite the win for my alma mater, Newport Harbor. They had been long yearning for a win such as that. So good for Newport Harbor. Anyway, also in terms of the Dave Moe's tournament... Lakewood actually upset Cathedral Catholic. Now, Lakewood and, Re- and Redondo Union were both nationally ranked. I think they're in the top 100 on max preps. And I also saw that Redondo Union was the number three team on... It, they were the number three team in California. And Cathedral Catholic, I also think, was top 25, if not top 50. And Lakewood was, all, was like right behind them. I want to say... Lakewood was number was in the 30s while what you call it Lakewood was number 36 while Cathedral Catholic was number 23 so it's quite astounding to see Lakewood pulling off that one but Lakewood has a legit team I think that team is going to do great things in the southern section playoffs and they almost beat powerhouse modern day which I want to say is the number two team in the nation, if not, they are the number one team in the state. As I think this, I think uh, California is starting to show its chops when it comes to volleyball. So I really hope someone can challenge Modern Day. I don't know if anyone can challenge Modern Day. They have been challenged and they have been pushed, but. I, it still remains to be seen if Modern Day can be beaten in girls volleyball. I think it's po- it is possible, but with the way that Modern Day is playing, I don't think it's fully possible. But we'll see. 
I, I think there's no team is without its weaknesses, that's for sure. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens with the Monarchs and their schedule. And it was quite amazing to see Lakewood win that tournament. They definitely earned it over Cathedral Catholic. I thought Cathedral Catholic was going to win the whole thing. Well, actually, no. I thought Redondo Union was going to win the whole thing, and then they got upset, and then they finished fifth, which wasn't bad. I mean, finishing fifth isn't too bad, especially when you play Cathedral Catholic in the quarterfinals, and that's a team no one really plays a whole lot just because San Diego and whatnot. So... All in all, I think it was still a solid tournament for Redondo Union. I think they're still learning, like I said. And I don't think anyone should say that they underachieved. I think they still achieved. It's just that they kind of got a little surprised in pool play. So, I don't know. I think I think once uh, the all these tournaments that pass by, be, all these national tournaments that pass by, like Durango and Las Vegas... And the Nike Arizona tournament passed by. I think we'll see which teams are the nationally ranked and which teams are the pretenders. So we'll see. So that's all that I got for high school volleyball. I'm not going to try to bore everybody just because I haven't been paying attention to everything in terms of all over the globe when it comes to volleyball, just California. But I did go to the Dave Most tournament this past weekend, and I saw some good volleyball. I wish I could have seen the championship match between Lakewood and Cathedral Catholic, but I unfortunately was busy. I had to go to Larry's semi-pro football game, and PA announced that. So now let's jump on over back to the NCAA women's volleyball matches for week number four. So this week's noteworthy matchups, we don't have... I didn't make too big of a list just because... I thought that there were some noteworthy matches and there were some not-so-noteworthy matches. I didn't go hog-wild like I did last week and the previous week. So so let's start with Tuesday, which is tomorrow. There actually is one match going that's going to be playing tonight, and it's going to be Utah at Boise State. So Utah will be hitting the road to Idaho to take on the Broncos of Boise State. But for tomorrow, we have a very good matchup right here. Gina, I don't know if you're listening, but number 16 Stanford travels to Lincoln, Lincoln, Omaha to take on number 6 Nebraska. Now, this is a very good matchup just because Nebraska is such a hotbed when it comes to volleyball. That is the big sport that Nebraska is really, 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 really good at. And I would not be surprised if there was a packed house. And also keep in mind that Nebraska was the runner-up to Stanford back in the 2018 NCAA tournament. I want to say it was the 2018 NCAA tournament, if I'm not mistaken. Or was it 19? Because Stanford, Stanford, okay, Stanford won in 19 against Wisconsin. So yeah, it was 18. So I'm just making sure. I'm just... Do, trying to remember all the calculations in my head. But I digress. So Stanford-Nebraska is going to be a very fun matchup, and I would not be surprised if Nebraska needed to take its anger out on Stanford. Just because there was also a little bit of an incident that happened that I guess went viral and that everyone flipped out over. But that's all water under the bridge. So, And it was also something that... Uh, it wasn't the Stanford women's volleyball team that did it. It was, like, I guess someone else from Stanford, but I digress on it. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I just think that that's all in the past, so, yeah. Anyway, so on Wednesday, we have the Battle of the Bluegrass as number 8 Kentucky heads on down to number 5 Louisville. Now, that's going to be a very fun matchup. It's an interstate rivalry, and this is between two teams that are trying to prove themselves. Louisville is in the top five, and they need to prove themselves that they deserve that top five standing, while Kentucky, the reigning NCAA champion, will be facing its rival on the road, even though it's kind of interstate. So Kentucky is kind of looking for that big breakout win. They went one and one. They lost to Wisconsin in four. They did all that they could against the Badgers, but... The Wildcats just fell short as they'll take on the Cardinals, and this is going to be a very fun matchup, and I think there will be a lot of drama and great, like, 
great plays by both teams because both teams have very talented players. So I think it's going to be a that is the most noteworthy matchup for Wednesday. It's the only noteworthy matchup I actually have on Wednesday. Then on Thursday we have two noteworthy matchups. So we'll start, we'll start with the honorable mention. Well, I I don't really call it honorable mention, but I think this one's kind of underrated. We have number 18 Georgia Tech at Arkansas. Now Arkansas, I'm putting a little stock into just because Arkansas, in my opinion can make the NCAA tournament, and they were the first four teams out from last year's NCAA tournament. And for them, a win over Georgia Tech would only help them going forward. It would boost their confidence going into conference play, which is next week, as everyone's going to be starting conference play next week. For Georgia Tech, their only loss was to UCLA, as they kind of got challenged in their own little tournament last year, they, or not last year, last week, as they got pushed to four by Indiana and Oklahoma, two teams coming from Power 5 conferences. So for those two, it was a good little challenge against Georgia Tech, as Georgia Tech will look to try to get back to its dominance over Arkansas, but I think Arkansas can give them a battle, so we'll see if Arkansas can do that. But then the big headline matchup on Thursday is the holy war between number 15 BYU at number 10 Utah. So this is obviously the battle of the Utah teams. BYU coming off of that loss to Pitt as they went 2-1 and one that weekend in the Panther tournament. While Utah is undefeated as they went a perfect 3-0 and oh last weekend and they defeated Nebraska in five sets. So Utah still has to prove that they deserve that top 10 recognition. I think Utah can beat BYU. I think BYU is still a little young, and Danny Drews is playing great as of late. I think Utah will get the win over BYU. I didn't really make my predictions for Kentucky, Louisville, and Nebraska-Stanford, just because both of those matchups are really tough to predict. But I'm confident in picking Utah over BYU. And who knows, maybe the women's volleyball team will want to get a little revenge on BYU after their football team lost to BYU. Then we have Friday. We only have two noteworthy matchups on Friday. We'll start with number 3, Ohio State at Notre Dame. This is Notre Dame's chance to try to try to get better, and more importantly, to face a very talented Ohio State team. For Ohio State, this is kind of their last little tune-up before conference play starts. You'll also see why Notre Dame and Ohio State are both noteworthy matchups. Then, also on Friday, we have number 21, San Diego, hitting the road down the 405 to take on unranked USC or Southern California. So USC split its last week's matches against Hawaii. They won no, they lost the first match, but then won the second match. The, both matches went four sets. This is kind of USC's last little tune-up before conference play. And I'm just going to tell it to you right now. Pac-12 play is going to be brutal for USC if they don't play their cards right. I think USC could still do good in Pac-12 play, but it's they haven't really shown it with their number of wins. Like, against Kentucky, they got swept. Against Creighton, they almost pulled off the reverse sweep, but they just stalled out in that fifth set, which they were up 13-10, to but they just couldn't get those last two points. So USC really needs to win this matchup over San Diego. San Diego would get a big win. It would be a big win for the Toreros if they take down the Trojans. But we'll have to see if the Toreros can get that win. I think the Toreros can pull off the win, but I would not sleep on USC. I think USC is that sleeper team, and I think they are underrated, and I think Even if you're not a USC fan, you should buy stock on USC. So for Saturday, we have three noteworthy matches. The first matchup is number 5 Louisville at number 6 Nebraska. Now this is another one of those Midwest-Southern matchups. It's a really good matchup for both the Cornhuskers, or the Huskers, and the Cardinals. This is the battle of two Power 5 conference teams, 
And also, this is another test for Louisville because they are hitting the road to take on Nebraska. And this is a big matchup to prove that they deserve that top five recognition. Nebraska, on the other hand, is going to be playing its second big test. This time, they will still be at home and they will be facing a top five team. This is Nebraska's last tune up just because conference play is going to be really tough. Big, the Big Ten is going to be a battle because you have Wisconsin, Ohio State, Nebraska, like I said. Minnesota, Penn State, even though Minnesota and Penn State are a little down, I think they're still never to be counted out. And then you also have Michigan, which has improved. They had an iffy weekend against North Carolina and Duke, but still a solid showing. And then, coercely, now that I mentioned Duke and North Carolina, I think the ACC is also going to be a battle for Louisville because Louisville and Pitt are basically the top two teams in the ACC. They're both undefeated. And another team to watch out for is North Carolina. That team is 8-0. and And believe it or not, they beat Duke in a non-ACC game last weekend. Now, Duke obviously lost prior to that to Michigan. But for North Carolina, coercely, they defeated Michigan in five sets. And believe it or not, they were actually down 23-19 to in set number four. And it looked as if North Carolina was going to suffer its first loss of the season. Then, six points later, the Tar Heels forced a fifth set, and they won that fifth set. Absolutely amazing, and it's really, really quite astounding that North Carolina is doing great this year. I think most people need to, more people need to buy more stock on North Carolina. I don't know North Carolina, who North Carolina has this week... I'm actually just going to look that up right now. As Now, here's the story for Duke, North Carolina. Now, Duke and North Carolina were actually supposed to face Michigan State and Michigan, but then Michigan State had to cancel both those matchups as, both of, as uh, Michigan State had COVID contact tracing. So, unfortunately for North Carolina and Duke, they couldn't play Michigan State. But they decided to agree to face one another in a non-ACC match. As looking at North Carolina's last few matchups this week, or looking at North Carolina's matchups this week, they are at home against Elon, and then they are home against Charlotte, and then they are also home against Davidson. If North Carolina plays their cards right, they'll be 11-0 going into conference play. And that would be ideal because their first matchup is a doozy in the ACC as they're facing Pitt, which also is undefeated, and they are number four in the nation. So North Carolina could use all the wins they could get because it only gets tougher from here. But looking at the North Carolina schedule, they do have to contend with, obviously, Pitt. And they also got to contend with Duke, which anything can happen in that tobacco rivalry. Then Georgia Tech looks good. They have to play them on the road. Notre Dame, I'm pretty sure will have their you-know-what together by the time ACC play happens. Louisville, they got to play them. And then North Carolina closes out the season, the regular season, at Duke. So looking at how many matchups, or how many ACC matches uh, Duke has, or North Carolina has, Looks like they've got 17. Am I counting that correctly? Four. Eighteen. Eighteen matches. So, North Carolina can still finish 500 if they win six out of those 18 matches. If they go 11-0. Actually, they need to win seven. Well, actually, no, no, I, I, I'm lying here. Um, they have 18 matches. Let's say they are 11 and 0 going into ACC play, and I think people need to start the need to start buying stock on North Carolina because I think that team is good. Last season, they had a bunch of injuries, and it didn't do them any good. And they also had to deal with COVID and whatnot. So, I think people need to for, need to remember that North Carolina actually upset Notre Dame, and they also upset. Florida State, which both were ranked at the time. Notre Dame was more ranked than ever, so... For North Carolina, I think people need to not sleep on this team. And if they are 11-0 and and going into conference play, then they would need to win six matches. Yeah, they would need to win six matches 
out of their 18 to guarantee a 500 uh, to guarantee a 500 record or actually actually no or was it 5 either way they need to win as much as they can cuz they obviously can't just bank on winning on being an at large team because it all depends on where they finish in the ACC. Like, North Carolina could make the NCAA tournament, but they got to play their cards right. So, there's that for North Carolina. I'm getting off track. Back to Louisville, Nebraska. This is going to be one final test for Louisville and Nebraska, and both those teams are going to be are going to be in a tough one when it comes to conference play. Nothing is going to be guaranteed. Also, another team that's going to be another pair of teams that's going to be having their final tune-up is number 23, Tennessee, at number 8, Purdue. Now, Tennessee is coming off of two wins over Moorhead State, and they're currently ranked number 22 in the NCAA. Coaches polls. So this is their last little big test before SEC play. Now, Tennessee is also in the same boat as North Carolina is. I think that team can make the NCAA tournament, if they beat Purdue, that would be really big for the Vols. But for Purdue, they got to this is their their biggest test before ACC play because if I'm not mistaken, Purdue opens up ACC play against Ohio State and Ohio State is as good as advertised even though Ohio State hasn't really been fully tested other than Washington. So for Purdue this is their opportunity to get back on track for Tennessee. This is their opportunity to boost their strength of schedule or their ratings. Because if they do finish 500, they'll have on their resume that win over Baylor, which Florida can't say they have. And then they can also have that win over Purdue as well, which that's also huge as well. So we'll have to see what happens with Tennessee and Purdue. I think... Tennessee can give Purdue a run for their money. I would put my money on Purdue, but I would not be surprised if Tennessee were to at least push the match to five. I know they'll push it to four, that's for sure, because Tennessee has all sorts of talent. And then the last noteworthy matchup on Saturday is the matchup I hopefully plan to go to. Number 21, San Diego at Long Beach State. That is a 4 p.m. Pacific time start game. Again, I hope to go to this matchup. It's the battle of two non-Power 5 conferences. And also, this is San Diego's last... I mean, I wouldn't say last official tune-up, just because I think San Diego is a very, very talented team. I think I hate to say this about Long Beach State, but San Diego is, like, miles better than them. I think they're kind of miles better than them. They have all sorts of talent, and... I think this is a San Diego team that is looking to put everyone on notice that they are for real. Like, San Diego is playing two road matches, and for the most part, San Diego is not going to get challenged in the in the uh, West Coast Conference until, they, until October 14th hits when they hit the road down the 405 to Malibu to take on Pepperdine. Like, that lo- like once they start playing Pepperdine on... Thursday, October 14th, then it starts to get tougher for San Diego, because then they got Loyola Marymount two days after. For those that remember, San Diego lost to Loyola Marymount in five on the road, which cost them dearly, and eventually cost them the West Coast Conference Championship. And then also, San Diego plays BYU at BYU, and that's going to be a very tough matchup for the Toreros, as last year, despite having a young team, BYU swept San Diego in the series, and they swept San Diego at San, at uh, BYU. And then also, don't sleep on Santa Clara as well, because Santa Clara has a very talented team. It's just that whenever they get the chance to hit the core, and when they have those practice reps, and when they have those matchups that they are either pushing their opponent to the distance, or they're actually pulling off the upset, Santa Clara can prove to be dangerous, because... They have the hitters, and they have the setter, and all that stuff. It's just that they need to put it all together. Now, for Long Beach State, I'm a little biased when I say this. Long Beach kind of needs to win this match. They are coming off of a 1-2 and two showing in the 
Washington State Invitational. They lost to then winless Washington State in three sets. That loss, however, to Washington State does not do it justice, just because Washington State had played tougher opponents than Long Beach State did. Not that Long Beach State's opponents were pushovers. It's just that Washington State was 0-4, having lost to a bunch of very talented opponents like South Carolina, UNLV, Purdue, and Pitt. So, for Long Beach State, this is kind of their final tune-up before conference play begins when they face Cal Poly, which they've kind of been on the up-and-down swing as well, as that first matchup will be at Long Beach State. So, we'll see what happens with Long Beach State. Again, I hope to to uh, attend that matchup so I can provide you all with the coverage, and I could provide you all with the video clips like I did when Georgia Tech played UCLA, and Long Beach State had its little scrimmage or exhibition match against Pepperdine. So those are all the Saturday matchups that I have down in terms of matches to watch for. Then on Sunday, we have Notre Dame at number 3, Ohio State. Now, why am I picking this matchup again? Well, the reason why this matchup is noteworthy is because it's going to be televised nationally. It's going to be televised on ESPN2, which is really, 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 really awesome. They only have two matches, two volleyball matches on ESPN or televised nationally. This matchup, and then we have Purdue and Penn State. That's going to be televised in the near future. So... This matchup between Notre Dame and Ohio State will be televised on ESPN2. I hate how this matchup has to be on a Sunday just because it has to compete with the NFL. Like I if I if it were up to me, I would want to I would want Ohio State and Notre Dame the first matchup to be on Thursday and the second matchup to be on Saturday. So I don't know if that was the coach's fault or how ESPN2 wanted it, but at least we're going to get some volleyball televised nationally. I just hope the ratings will be good. So I encourage volleyball fans to please watch that match if you don't have if you have ESPN two, which you should because that's televised nationally. Whew. Anyway, the last matchup to watch for on Saturday is number sixteen Stanford at number eight Kentucky. Stanford, the 2019 NCAA champion, takes on the 2020 NCAA champion in Kentucky. So this is going to be a fun little matchup between the Cardinal and the Wildcats. This is Stanford's last tune-up before they begin Pac-12 play, which they are slated to finish fourth, I want to say, behind Oregon, behind UCLA, Oregon, and Washington. Whereas Kentucky is looking to defend its SEC crown, they are the fourth time, well, they've won the SEC the past four four years, or the past four seasons, as for Kentucky, they're still a little bit on the rebuilding process after losing Gabby Curry, Madison Lilly, and Avery Skinner to graduation. Well, Avery Skinner transferred, and then Gabby Curry... Is I think she's playing professional volleyball, and then Madison Lilly is also going to play professional volleyball. And she's just living life. So regardless, this is going to be one final test for Stanford and Kentucky. Kentucky, I think, will have a... They shouldn't have too many problems in the SEC, but it's not going to be a cakewalk like it was last year, where they pretty much just lost one match, and then they just skipped to my lewd all the way to the championship. Like, there are going to be some legitimate teams. And Florida is also legitimate as well. And I can also say that Florida will also play Florida State in the Battle of Florida, which I also consider a rivalry just because those two love to play one another in certain sports, mainly football. But the Florida State-Florida rivalry is the final tune-up for Florida and Florida State. That's kind of my honorable mention. That's going to be played on Wednesday. And for those two... I would think that those two would want to go all out. I think Florida State can challenge Florida, but for Florida, this is kind of their little tune-up matchup or last little wake-up call to get back on track just because Florida had a bad weekend against Baylor. I know Baylor is a very good team, but I also can say that they could have at least pushed one of the matches to five. The second match that they lost was unacceptable. And they know it. So we'll see if Florida can pull off the victory. But 
that is going to do it for all of these noteworthy volleyball matches to watch for in week number four. And that's going to do it for this week's episode of Set Point. Without any further delay, let us drop the beat, because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you all very much for tuning in to Set Point. I really do appreciate you all. If you are listening live on Playback, I appreciate you. If you are listening live currently, I appreciate you. If you are listening in the wee hours of the morning, I appreciate you. If you are listening at work, I appreciate you. If you're listening at all, I appreciate you. Big shout out to the chat room for tuning in. Gina G and Brad Buckingham popped in for a little bit. I appreciate you all for tuning in. For everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Terry Rodriguez signing off. See you all later on in the week for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, depending on when that'll be. I will see you on the other side. Have a great rest of the week, everybody. Peace!